Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button below. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au. Welcome to this 72nd Australian Water School webinar brought to you by Ice Warm. And we're delighted so many could join us today. Uh, my name's Trevor Piller. I'm the National Partnerships Manager here at Ice Warm uh, and the webinar chair. Um, what, um, what we'd like to say is that there's a, a quite a widespread of um, uh, participants here today. Uh, look at them across the globe there. It's just an, a topic of great interest and, and uh, one that should be of great interest too. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, uh, just wanted to say how, how good it is that you could come on and, uh, and have a discussion about this. And I, I really want to underline that. Um, the training coming up, you can see there, there's a ground model modeling training coming up in two weeks time, less now. No, two weeks time with Conrad and Wolfgang and the uh, Smart Technologies, uh, Smart Networks from SA Water, South Australia Water, Peter Silsikas and Luke Dix, and the Sediment Transport Modelling um, by Marty Teal, uh, Stanford Gibson, and Cray Price. Um, then uh, Arun is gonna speak about the state and fate of Hindu Kush Himalaya water resources. Um, and three online courses there. Look, I won't, won't go through them in any more detail than that, that's enough already, uh, but if you go along to the Australian Water School website, you'll find all the details and can register for those upcoming trainings. Right into today's presenters and panelists, it's Dr. Matt Gibbs and Dr. Steve Hemming. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Yep, come on board, do that. That'll be great, turn on your camera, Steve, that'll be terrific, and your microphones. Uh, Dr. Matt Gibbs, um, yeah, it has a joint position between Department of Environment and Water here in South Australia and also the University of Adelaide in South Australia, uh, capital of South Australia, in fact. Uh, he, uh, Matt is the principal hydrologist in the science monitoring and knowledge branch, focuses on science direction and support to our biggest river, River Murray. Policy and advice is also a postdoctoral fellow with the University of Adelaide. Dr. Steve Hemming is an associate professor in Indigenous Indigenous Nations and Collaborative Futures Research Hub at the Jambana Institute for Indigenous Education Research at the University of Techno Technology, Sydney. Both welcome and thank you for your time today. Tell us, Matt, what, uh, what is it that drives you along this, this course toward um, better river management? Uh, yeah, it's a very um, interesting problem. There's always uh, new challenges to, to look at. So uh, yeah, it's always, always evolving and keeps you, keeps you on your toes. No time for sleeping to <laughs> get you out of bed in the morning. <laughs> uh, that's what, what gets me out of bed in the morning is seeing people like yourself and, and Steve uh, revved up and uh, keen to see a, a better way forward in river management. And yourself, Steve? Uh, yeah, no, I've been um, working on issues with uh, Indigenous nations around, I guess, more justice and engagement around river management for a while. And the last sort of 10, 15 years, worked on the um, Koorong Lower Lakes Murray Mouth Program, which was uh, the Ngunnawal Nations part was led by Ngunnawal and actually won the Australian River Prize in 2015 for the kind of work that was being done. Fantastic. I, I can't wait to get into this. This is great balance between the science and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, the, and the data and the evidence and, and, the, and then the, the people, the people who've been here for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, um, such a great balance. I can't wait to get to get into this. But before we do, there's this terrific poll that thank you everybody's been uh, been looking at. Uh, thank you, Christy. That's great. Um, so where are people from? Did you expect that, Steve? Expect that, Matt? Nearly half from policy no, and planning. It's a, a broad range of people. It so is. An audience to be talking to. Twenty-five percent from commercial consulting. That's terrific. Thank you, everybody. This is ter terrific to see this. I'm. Skimming down, stop me wherever you want to, Matt or Steve. How aware of the Murray Darling Basin and Basin Plan are you? Uh, yeah, I think it was um, just interested, interested to see how people responded to these uh, question two and three here, I guess. Um, yeah. Seeing the map you showed earlier, there's people from all over the world, so uh, didn't want to make assumptions about what people understood. Um, but yeah, good to see that you know, most people have heard of the Murray Darling Basin and the Basin Plan and hmm. uh, I think, I don't know if there is a correct answer to number three, but uh, most people are agreeing with what I would say. Um, it's not just water that's left in the river, but it's water that we uh, have set aside and used to try and get environmental benefits. There's still uh, a high number who voted for, for that first one. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I nearly yeah. did when I, when I did the poll, I nearly said, oh yeah, it's the water we don't use. 
Um, and for some reason, no, it's not myself. Like, <laughs> yeah. By default, it is going to uh, the environment, I guess. Hmm. Um, and yeah, like I said, I don't know if there, there probably isn't a, a formal definition, um, but it is a it's a harder one than you first first imagine, I think. Yeah. It's, looking at the questions at the bottom there, it's good to good to see there are a few people who are working in contexts where there are treaties in place with Indigenous nations, and um, just to let people know that. South Australia was moving towards a treaty a couple of years ago, but that's stalled a little bit. But treaties are being discussed in Australia at the moment. And it's nice to see that the majority of people recognise that um, Indigenous nations um, can make a huge contribution to the health of river systems, particularly. Absolutely. And does your job involve Indigenous water? And before that, no. So we're talking to a lot of people that will be listening today. That, 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 not, that, well, I mean, yes, as are going to listen as well. I'm not trying to say that, but um, but it's good to have newer uh, approaches to this. Um, uh, and look at the yeses for uh, do you think Indigenous nations' a strong say in their futures is going to help? It's definitely going to help. Yeah, thank you, everybody. That that's that's an absolutely great um, great response. Appreciate your uh, responses there. Um, right. Well, enough of the poll. Thank you so much for your time on that. Uh, let's get right into this, shall we? I'm going to hand right over to you, Matt. Let's uh, let's hear what uh, you've got to say at the front here. It'll set the scene for us. And and people, can I just say, all attending, uh, write your questions on the Q and A tab there. We we'd love to have that. Put your hand up if you want to come on screen and talk. We we can um, uh, take a few questions on the way through. Mostly we'll keep them from, for the end. But uh, by all means, start writing as soon as possible. Over to you, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Trevor. Um, yeah, so today we're running through a couple of projects that have been uh, running over the last couple of years as part of the Goethe Institute for Water Research. Um, so, and this project's really looking at trying to understand some of the in-channel processes that are happening uh, as we try and manage, you know, we're trying to increase inundation a lot through the, through the river, but sometimes the in-channel parts get forgotten. Um, so we're trying to improve uh, our understanding in the, in the channel as well. Uh, so to give a bit of context on that, uh, just get my slides working. Um, first, I should say there's a lot of people involved in this project. Uh, I won't run through them all, but the first stop point of people are people uh, on this Goiter project of different components. So there's quite a few tasks looking at different different parts of the the um, food web. Uh, so each one of those people have done have contributed to what I'm presenting today. Uh, and then also here in the in the Department for Environment and Water, uh, a lot of people involved in the hydrological modelling that underpins a lot of this. Um, so to, to outline some of that context, uh, we're looking at a little bit of the floodplain in South Australia. This is the Pike floodplain. Uh, you can see the town of Renmark, if you know that, uh, up, to the, up the top there. And this is our, our um, some hydraulic modelling outputs looking at inundation frequency for you know, a pre-basin plan flow regime. Uh, and the main channel and the anna branches are in the, the light blue colour. And you can see that to get, you know, broader parts of the floodplain wet, they're only getting wet sort of once every six years, once every seven years. Uh, and that doesn't really align with what we understand vegetation uh, needs. Um, so because of this, you know, drying out of the floodplains, much more reduced frequency of inundation, uh, there's a reason why we have you know, a basin plan and environmental water. Um, so we can see that you're putting in a natural flow regime, um, the floodplain was, large parts of it was getting wet, you know, once every three years or so. Um, that lines up with what we understand the trees need. Um, and we know that the basin plan and what all the benefits we can achieve aren't, isn't going to replace this, this natural flow regime. You know, we're not trying to do that. Um, so there always are more benefits we can make on top of what we can achieve with just, just flow alone. Uh, and by that, I mean you know, infrastructure to try and help us uh, get more for every drop of water that's available. Uh, this is the Chowla regulator. Uh, it goes around lock six, um, a, that creates a head difference in the river. Um, so at, through this creek, there's a gradient that we can use to, to flood out the floodplain behind it. Um, so in this photo, it's holding back about uh, two and a half or three metres of water uh, to try and inundate the, those red gums in the background. Um, so we can use big structures like this to try and increase that inundation frequency uh, when flow alone wouldn't, wouldn't have done it. Uh, we also have you know, structures that have been around for a long time in the, in the river. This is, this is Lock 1 near Blanchetown. So historically, um, the water levels have been managed. You can see the crane there uh, taking some stop logs out. 
Um, but that's sort of just changed every day or how often it needs to change uh, to keep the water level upstream as constant as possible, at least historically. Uh, but now uh, we recognise that um, that's not very natural and we'd like to restore some of the, the variability in water levels that, that would have happened. Uh, so more and more we're trying to use the infrastructure we've got to, to create a more natural um, watering regime. So that's all, all good if you're you know, out of the bank, if you're one of these trees uh, and looking to be inundated more frequently than, than historically or the recent history at least. Um, so we can build these structures and try and inundate those. Uh, but if we think about what else is happening when we do that, um, if you look at the photo there, this is part of that pike floodplain we saw before. Um, there'd be some, some velocity that water's flowing through at for a given, given discharge. If we decide these trees are looking not in the greatest condition, we'll use our structure that's downstream on the right uh, and inundate this, this part of the floodplain. Uh, that's great to increase the frequency of flooding, um, give these trees a drink. But it does mean that if it's the same flow, uh, we've increased the storage, we've increased the, the cross-sectional area, um, the velocity must have reduced. So if you're something that's living in this creek, a fish or something that relies on faster flowing water, um, potentially that, that might be lost if we, if we're sort of trying to look after the trees, we might be compromising another part of the ecosystem. Another thing that's happening there is uh, there's a whole heap of uh, resources out on the floodplain that we're bringing back into the water. Uh, carbon and nutrients and things like that. Uh, and that can be a really good thing to, to kick off the, ecos the, the food web. Uh, but because we're, uh, we're changing the, the sort of natural flooding regime here, uh, that can also lead to problems uh, if we're bringing a lot of, a lot of carbon or nutrients in uh, to a lower flow, uh, there's an increased chance of um, black water, hypoxic, black, hypoxic black water events uh, and algal blooms, for example. So this whole project is geared around trying to provide some information and some uh, quantitative uh, things we can compare, some thresholds and things, to make sure that we don't uh, compromise these in-channel outcomes uh, when we're trying to do benefits uh, on the floodplain. Uh, so that's really what this project has done. It's been a lot of uh, field work, a lot of sort of empirical evidence, uh, where people have been out and about counting things, um, parts of uh, Murray Cod larvae and zooplankton, uh, looking at the carbon on the floodplains uh, to try and understand uh, how these things change in the channel, uh, which we don't have as good a handle on as, as the inundation on the floodplains. Uh, so one big part of this project has been looking at that, that hypoxic blackwater question. Um, so you can see what happens if uh, this does happen down the bottom right. It's a, it's a large Murray cod um, in the 2016 blackwater event uh, after those high flows. Um, so as part of a, the hydrological model that we have to represent how the flow changes uh, when we operate these structures, it's a new water source model. Um, we developed a, a water quality model as part of that uh, that can model the, the, the black water processes. Uh, so that's what the picture at the top left is trying to represent. Um, it's tracking the uh, organic matter on the floodplain uh, while it's dry, how that accumulates over time. And then when we get it wet, uh, it looks at how much of the, that carbon leaches out of the organic matter, uh, how that breaks down and when break, broken down by bacteria, microbes, that uses up oxygen. Uh, and that's what we're, I guess, interested in mainly. Uh, it's also the, the dissolved organic carbon as well. Uh, but does, does inundating the floodplain with a lower flow mean that we're going to have hypoxic conditions, you know, low dissolved oxygen occurring? Uh, so at the top right, you can see some of the results comparing to historical data. Um, and we can generally get this, to, this model to work quite well. Um, but that's predicated on uh, doing quite a lot of field work. We've been out looking at what are the uh, organic loads on the floodplains, that's what the bottom, bottom left is showing, um, and trying to relate what we see out there to the vegetation types so we can upscale this to you know, the, whole, the whole floodplain in South Australia. Um, so now we have this tool, we can look at um, what happens if we start messing with these structures. Uh, that's what we're looking at here. It's just some, some hypothetical examples. Uh, as we start filling up the floodplain, different water levels, different rates of rising. Um, that's important is how much organic matter gets inundated uh, you know, per day, effectively. Um, so if that gets too high, uh, if organic loads, dissolved organic carbon coming in gets too high, uh, that can use up a lot of the dissolved oxygen that's in the water. 
so we can use this to start informing our operational planning. How should we operate the structure? Uh, temperature is another important part that it includes. So if we push it later in the year, the reaction rates all speed up. Uh, that can also mean uh, more oxygen gets consumed uh, more quickly. So we can start using this tool to look at uh, how we operate individual structures and also cumulatively as we operate up and down the river. This is not you know, happening on one plane, it's happening all the way up and down the Murray. Um, so it does you know, one operation at once, one site upstream influence what's happening at the next one downstream. So we can start looking at these scenarios to, to try and avoid these, these um, bad, out, bad outcomes happening. Uh, so that's been one big part of the project, a lot of uh, model development, a lot of field work. Uh, and the other big part has been looking at uh, the food web processes. Um, so again, lots of field work. Uh, if we're starting at the bottom and looking at the, the phytoplankton and the algae, um, and we know if uh, we get things uh, quite stagnant conditions in quite hot, hot uh, water, we can have you know, de detrimental phytoplankton in the water. So this is a blue-green algal bloom. Um, but we can also have um, you know, more preferable phytoplankton species occurring. So uh, they can be a better food, food item for, for higher species up in the food web. So the zooplankton will eat those, if I get my slides right. Um, so if we can get you know, the more desirable phytoplankton species, uh, then the zooplankton will eat them. Uh, and then that can be a food source for, for fish larvae. So that's a little, little Murray cod there. Uh, so if we can keep that, that food web flowing uh, and having the habitat conditions there, we can uh, be more confident we're getting the ecological outcomes that we're aiming for. So you know, having uh, better species of zooplankton in the water may not be something that you know written as an objective in the basin plan, but you know the food web that leads up to having more golden perch or more Murray cod or uh, more water birds, food for them, uh, it starts at this really bottom of the food chain. So we're trying to understand how can we keep this food web uh, intact uh, to get to the sort of the more iconic uh, outcomes uh, that are probably more more uh, people more aware of. Uh, so as I said, there's been a lot of field work going on um, and through that we've managed to identify some, some criteria we can use to assess uh, if we think some of these processes are going to start breaking down. Um, so the first one on the left is a, is a mixing criteria that's been around for a while. Um, it looks at the, the velocity, how fast the water's flowing, how deep is the water. It also has some terms around the solar radiation coming in. So that's an indication of the water stratified, um, which also points to the more um, less desirable uh, phytoplankton species coming through, so the blue-green algae and things. So if we can avoid that stratification, um, it's more likely that we'll have uh, the more desirable pathways happening. Uh, and then for the zooplankton and the, the Murray cod, they're dependent on, on drift in the, in the water column. So we want to keep the, enough velocity in the water uh, to keep them entrained, keep them moving through the, through the channel, through the creeks, uh, so that they can spread out and become more abundant. We've got more of them, there's more food, we can support a bigger population. So uh, some of the field work has shown that we tend to find more of these, these little critters um, with velocities exceeding 0.2 meters a second and up to 0.3 meters a second, depending on which process of their life stage we're looking at. So um, even though there's quite a complicated uh, conceptual model under here of what's going on, we can break it down to some pretty simple metrics of uh, maintaining velocities, uh, avoiding stratification, to try and assess our different infrastructure options. Um, yeah, so the, the trick then becomes um, our hydrological model, our source model, where we can assess you know, what these structures do to the water balance. doesn't give us these terms directly. So we need to get them in there somehow. Uh, so this is just showing how we've, how we've done that. There's been a whole heap of hydraulic modeling behind this that represents this, that's the more physical model. Um, solving the conservation of momentum equations, shallow water wave equations. So looking at, um, if we have a certain flow upstream and a certain water level at our structure downstream, uh, what is the velocity range in that reach? So then our hydrological model, if each one of those numbers there is a different hydraulic model run, our hyd hydrology model, our simple source model, our water balance model, can come up and look at, okay, my flow is this and my water level is this. I can, I can get some information about the hydraulics without having to solve solve those equations every single time. So to get one of those numbers there, it might take oh, 
uh, matake dai of computer time, uh, now hard logic model can look it up almost instantaneously. So that's the real benefit. There's a whole heap of pre preprocessing that's going on to be able to get that information, you know, almost to that information dynamically. Uh, so then as an, an example of pulling this all together, um, if we're looking at, uh, this looks like a weeple raising at lot five, uh, looking at those water levels, um, for different flows coming down the river, for a given raising of that wood of that lock, should we do that or not? We can start looking at well, how does our hydraulics in the river change? What are the velocities doing? Do we expect that weir pool to become stratified? Um, will we see that? Do we expect the dissolved oxygen to change? Um, if we're creating some inundation that wasn't happening before, uh, so we can start assessing these processes that you know, conceptually we expect could be impacted. Um, now we can quantify them and compare. Well, what, how? What's the change compared to? increase an in area that we expect from uh, doing that weir pool raising. So it allows us to start assessing, you know, what's the impact of, of one of these operations? How does it um, impact down the river uh, to look at the different objectives for different years? So here, uh, as a hypothetical example, you might be more interested in uh, maintaining the in-channel velocities if you haven't had a, a fish uh, recruitment event for a few years. Or if that's tends to be if that's going quite well, we may be more interested in inundation of, of the floodplains. Uh, so we might be willing to trade off some of that faster flowing water for, for inundation. So it gives those the e water managers a lot more to information to start helping um, shape their objectives and what benefits and trade offs they may may be making. Uh, so that's what I really wanted to cover uh, today. Uh, there probably could be a, a webinar on each of these different components of the project. There's been uh, six tasks all up, uh, but really the the story is as we start trying to you know, bring every get the benefit out of every drop of water, uh, it's becoming much more complicated. Uh, there's increased uh, potential for trade offs. Um, so we're really trying to help help with that question by quantifying some of these these in stream changes to to set against you know the more obvious overbank inundation changes. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's all I wanted to say. Uh, as I said at the start, there's been quite a lot of um, partners as part of this project, uh, and we're really you know, getting to the end of it now. We're trying to test it out, make sure it's working, and implementing as we as we manage the river. That's, um, yeah. yeah, that's fantastic, Matt. That's, thanks very much. Um, I, I um, really appreciate it. The um, enormous amount of effort that goes behind this and I just wanted to say that I, I really want to say at the front for everyone um, that the, all this work comes out of the Goiter Institute here in South Australia. Uh, it, it's set up to inform policy and decision making and identify future threats to water security. So it, it's, a, it's a great organisation established uh, in a partnership between the SA Government, Department of Environment, uh, CSIRO, Flinders University, University of Adelaide, University of South Australia and ISWARM, our own organisation here. It's just, just says so much about the way uh, research um, is translated into policy. Um, and you can see from what's going on in this slide that there's just so many people involved. As you say, Matt, maybe a future webinar on each, each of those topics earlier. Um, yeah, there's, there's so much in it, infrastructure. Um, yeah, I want to go into all them. That's a, there's another time for another webinar. Well, look, um, no questions coming through at the moment, but look, let's do this. Um, thanks, Lisa, for your comment. Uh, great use of source water, Matt. Um, great use of source, sorry, the modelling source and informing optimal use of environmental water. Thanks for your comment, Lisa. Do, everyone, um, hit the Q&A uh, icon and uh, write your comments and questions and discussion. That'll, be, that'll make this a great, um, a great time together. But, well, look, we'll move right on then to Steve. Um, talk about Indigenous involvement in water management. We're looking forward to it, Steve. Um, over to you. Okay. I just, as you can see, my, uh, my talk is a, is a related topic, but coming from a totally different angle. Um, I'm Steve Hemming. I'm uh, non-Indigenous, just to um, explain that to everyone straight up at the front. But I'm part of a team that includes uh, one Indigenous uh, professor, um, Daryl Rigney, and a, a community leader, Grant Rigney, along with some uh, Department for Environment and Water in South Australia um, uh, workers. So we're a kind of a combination team that actually uh, is working on this project. It's called the um, Translating Ngarindjiri Yanarumi into Water Risk Assessment or Resource Risk Assessment Project, which is a fairly complex title. 
and I'll work my way through explaining that to people. Now, just before I start, I'd like to um, recognise that we're, we're speaking on Ghana country from our end and the Ghana, Ghana nation of the, the nation that actually owns as the traditional lands for the, these lands in Adelaide. Um, just recognise other Indigenous people who might be joining in along with this uh, webinar and particularly pay respects to Ngarindri ancestors, elders and leaders and young people who've worked on a lot of the thinking behind this research. Um, this research has grown out of a, a program that sort of started back pretty much at the time of um, non-Indigenous invasion of country really, but it's continued on into more recent times with the focus on environmental management in the Lower Murray and Korong region of South Australia. Now, um, here's a, a summary of the, uh, the actual project itself, which is a, a Goiter Institute um, project. And it um, uniquely has indigenous uh, people who are members of the research team driving the research. So um, myself, Daryl Rigney, Grant Rigney, um, Lockie Sutherland, Hugh Wilson, and Noel over, over divest are the ones who are working on it. Two of those, those um, do up employees are water planners. So what we're trying to do is do research that generates change in, in um, government policy um, immediately. Now this is, uh, this country we're talking about, it's the bottom end of the, the River Murray, the river that system that um, Matt was talking about. Not injury country takes in the, the Koorong, the lower lakes and uh, the River Murray at the bottom end of the system. You can see a map there which shows some of the lands and of the Gunanjuri Nation down on the, on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, there's a front cover of, of a recent publication um, on the natural history of the region, Yalawa Rui, as it's called, Yalawa Rui being the term for Gunanjuri country. And if you're interested in um, looking up some of the, uh, the results of some of the work, there are chapters in there and a chapter written by Gunanjuri elders and leaders about Gunanjuri Yalawa Rui. Now, the, this project emerged out of a uh, 10 or 15 years of work between the state government and the Ngarindiri Nation to sort of generate a context where Ngarindiri could be involved in all aspects of environmental and river management, kind of complex work that Matt's talking about, the needs also to engage with Indigenous knowledges, um, Indigenous authority and responsibility and understand the impact of doing environmental management on Indigenous people and country. Now for Ngarindiri people, um, Yalawa Rui means the lands and the waters are a living body and the Ngarindiri people, the nation, are part of that land and that, those waters. So there's not a separation between what would be seen as natural environment and people. It's, um, something, it's a system that's one big living body. So if you do something to one part of that system, it affects all of the people and the plants, the animals all together. And there's a list of um, documents there on the screen. Um, there are agreements that set the basis for the research we're doing. One's a whole of government agreement between the state government and Ngarindiri Nation. Um, there's a speaking as country agreement, which recognises that Ngarindiri people speak as country. And there's also a cultural knowledge protection agreement, so that any knowledge that's used in, in research in these projects remains the knowledge belongs to Ngarindiri people as cultural knowledge. Um, in this sort of period, the Ngarindiri um, Nation have been working with government to try to re-educate around the kinds of understandings of country Ngarindiri people have and using the Kunga Ngarindiri Yanan agreement, listen to what Ngarindiri people have to say, which is on the screen there on the right hand side, um, Ngarindiri set up a joint task force with government to actually work together to start to get involved at all levels of planning and research on Ngarindiri country. And if you're interested, a number of the annual reports are online the Ngarindiri Nation's Sea Country Plan is the, the document on the left-hand side, which is written by Ngarindiri people and actually um, talks about what Ngarindiri people want to see for, for Ngarindiri country and how to engage and work together with Ngarindiri to, to uh, secure a healthy um, River Murray, Koorong Lakes. Now, <coughs> this project, um, Yanarumi, is actually a... Yanarumi means um, Ngarindiri people um, coming together to speak lawfully about what needs to be done to make things better. So it's a kind of a risk assessment decision-making process. Ngarindiri leaders had, all, had, all, had always and still used that system to engage with complex issues and, um, and programs. And at the heart of the questions that Ngarindiri ask are, are social justice issues. So you might see on the screen here a, a quote from three past uh, leaders who've passed, George Trevorrow, Matt Rigney and Tom Trevorrow. 
um, who ask questions about issues to do with effectively um, the, the, the absence of a treaty between the state of South Australia, the Australian government and Indigenous peoples and the consequences of that for Indigenous peoples in a place like South Australia, which haven't, haven't been good. It's only in recent times that things have started to improve. So being very involved in looking after country managing river is a fundamental priority for the, for the well-being of the Ngunnawal Nation and uh, for a better just arrangement. Um, so having regard to Ngunnawal values and uses associated with countries, a big question in, in planning at the moment. And Ngunnawal has started to do work around trying to um, find ways to translate um, those values and those uses into a form that can be used in planning by with non-Indigenous governments and scientists and others. And um, this, is a, this is a model that actually was developed by uh, Ngunnawal people at a workshop to try to think about what needed to be said in this context. And issues like security, opportunity, resources, authority and responsibility were identified at the heart of the right to be Ngunnawal and to make a living in the Ngunnawal way, which is what Ngunnawal people are attempting to do. There's a, um, the front of a, an exhibition a and a book there that was put together by Ngunnawal leaders as well, which um, just remind people of the history in South Australia where the, um, the land itself was actually taken and children were taken from families and um, people live in a very unjust um, environment for a long time. So consequences of that are still being obviously felt and are part of the issues that need to be dealt with in looking after country differently. Now in South Australia, um, there was a, a landmark issue that was, I guess, quintessential failure of communication and understanding around water management and, and land management called the Hindmarsh Island issue or Comrank issue for Ngunnawal, which led to a Royal Commission into um, Indigenous law and, um, and understandings, which I guess was a low point of the relations between government and Ngunnawal people. So what Ngunnawal were looking to do was to try to find a system to explain the values and the uses of country in a way that would um, lead to respect and uh, the opportunity to start to manage things together in a, in a positive way. Um, this table here is actually a, an approach that um, we worked on, which is part of this Yanarumi project, uh, which was attempting to actually find the core principles at the heart of Ngunnawal decision making and translate those into a form that could actually engage with things like um, ecological character descriptions in Ramsar um, planning documents and in other contexts. So there's actually an assessment there, the second, um, the second uh, row, uh, it starts with PARP and MIWI, which means longing for well-being in, in Ngunnawal terms. It's kind of the state of living um, within a colonised space. Um, and the Ramsar site itself, which is the Lower Lakes, Murray Mouth area in Koorong, we were assessing that area for its overall health. And issues to do with political context, um, uh, health of families, uh, access to resources, the health of uh, pelican breeding grounds, all had to be treated um, and dealt with together to try to get to a, an understanding of how healthy the, the lands and waters really are, taking into account people are also part of the lands and waters. And um, we included that in the um, ecological character description process to do a series of time slice assessments of health from a Ngunnawal perspective. I would argue that in recent times, things have improved with those agreements that I mentioned before and um, Ngunnawal having more of a voice uh, Yanarami to speak as country in the process and an opportunity to have a have a say over what should be done on Ngunnawal country. Now the Murray-Darling Basin Plan which has come into play in, in Australia um, which has been put in place to try to actually uh, look after the, the health of the Murray-Darling Basin system included in it um, some requirements for state governments to take into account Indigenous values and uses and to think about the risks of uh, environmental management and other decision making, irrigation and other practices that might have on indigenous well-being, social, cultural, political and in other contexts. And so this is a fairly new, new issue for governments to try to um, look at how they may take these, th these issues into account in planning. And so water resource plans that have been developed under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan have uh, had to take into account how the governments in each state are looking at uh, securing the risk to indigenous values in, in the processes and the planning. So what we've been doing in this project is 
really looking at that, that challenge and thinking about how risk assessments done within water planning, and this is a, a standard model of risk assessment, which is used in, in water planning in South Australia and in other contexts, which uses international standards as a, as a starting point and goes through a particular, what, particular process of assessing risk, which doesn't connect in with the, and it says establishing context there on the left-hand side, um, the context usually doesn't take into account Indigenous values, Indigenous um, wishes, uh, agreements between governments and Indigenous people in that context. And I guess we would have would have hoped that that would be the place where a treaty would actually sit. Um, the treaty would influence the way that the context was discussed, and that would then lead to um, the risks to Indigenous um, values, Indigenous uses of country, and Indigenous um, spiritual consequences becoming part of that um, consequence chain process and that Indigenous um, experts would be brought into the room when this risk management process was being um, undertaken. Um, environmental, um, economic, social values are, are considered in this space and uh, there's a decision made about what's actually bearable in a risk, what's viable and what's equitable and that's where Indigenous interests need to be inserted. So. A project sort of funded by Goida um, and including the Arundhati Nation as uh, members of the research team is built out of the work that was done during the, uh, the millennium drought period, which led to the development of, of various agreements and protocols and did lead to the, the win in the Australian River Prize for the collaborative approach to river management that Arundhati and uh, the South Australian government came up with to address the millennium drought period. Now, what we're, we're doing in this risk assessment process, we, through working closely with government um, through the Millennium Grout, Drought, Ngarindiri were able to start to understand how um, environmental management, water management actually um, takes place from policy development, planning development, through to on ground research, through to wetland management, um, building of structures to, to manipulate um, the levels of water. Um, in, in particular wetlands or within uh, weir pools. And it sort of took us to the, to the understanding that um, right at the heart of this process was a risk assessment um, mechanism that started off the thinking about how any particular project might occur. So identifying how Ngarindiri risk assessment processes could connect with water resource risk assessment seemed to be a critical um, thing to do to actually basically um, make the agreements that have been negotiated real in the policy development um, context. So we sort of realised in working in this space that uh, government and business use international standards to frame up how they go about risk assessment and, and looking at those international standards, they don't act, actually have um, um, Indigenous standards in those contexts, nor necessarily take into account the uh, the status of Indigenous peoples within settler societies, particularly in contexts where there aren't treaties in places. So we, we started to work out how to, how to do, do the work in this context. Um, so the stages of the project, um, and there's a photograph actually of a, a Kungan Ngarindri Yanan Agreement Task Force workshop, working, uh, government working with Ngarindri around planning and policy development back in 2013. So this kind of thinking has emerged out of that space. And the flag is a Ngarindiri flag, which was actually flown um, during the Hindmarsh Island issue to actually rec um, show people from a visual perspective what the Ngarindiri nation stood for. So there's been research on the literature to work out what's available internationally that might help. We've had workshops where scientists and, and um, planners have come together with, with Ngarindiri to talk about how each group does their risk assessment processes and how there might be connections that can be created and, and where the gaps are. And we've started to develop a translating, translating mechanism to put in place so that we can connect and embed in water risk assessment, um, indigenous values and um, uses and some of the commitments and agreements between the state and indigenous people. This is a photograph of one of the groups at one of the workshops recently and some of the results of the workshop on the, the left-hand side. So things like ensuring risk workshop formats include Indigenous expertise, um, that the context needs to take into account um, First Nations and First Nations requirements and First Nations um, values. And there needs to be resourcing for that, for those things to occur. Um, that the, um, that it, 
the process needs to have a proper um, consistency of language and everyone involved needs to understand what, what's being talked about. Um, so in terms of actually working towards the end of the project, we're, we're getting close. What we've been doing internally is, um, because we have DOA, uh, Department of Environment Water um, people on the project team, we're actually co-writing um, input straight into the, uh, the department's water risk assessment methodology so that we can make change to the way the policy looks um, as part of the project. So we've been, um, along with writing, um, writing reports and presenting in I mean, conferences, and working towards publications, we're developing the policy changes as we go as part of the actual project. And it says they're engaged research methodology. I guess it's, that really means that um, in, indigenous uh, people in this context are researchers in the project. The project is engaging with real problems and it's also including in, um, government employees who take responsibility for these issues in the research team to try to make the changes as we go. And we're doing this in the context of those agreements between the Na Ngunnawal Nation and the state, um, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, some um, guidelines, international instruments like the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And we're trying to uh, create a translator connector into uh, water risk, risk assessment. Um, we've been doing this for a while, so there's quite a bit of information available online if you're interested. And there's actually a portal that um, the, the Department for Environment and Water have put together with Ngadindiri that bring together a lot of the documents I've, and agreements that I've been referring to, to today. And that provides a, a basis for, for the kinds of context that need to be brought to the table when risk, water risk assessment starts in any context. And we've also been bringing other research dollars into this um, space. So there's a number of ARC Australian Research Council projects that we've been involved in that um, uh, support the work that Gord has been, been funding. One of those is actually to do with um, returning the remains of uh, human remains of um, Aboriginal people back to country that have been um, were taken in the past and put into museum collections. Um, a lot of the burial grounds that were um, ransacked um, by early scientists are part of the, the lands and waters that we're, we're looking to uh, collaboratively manage in the Murray-Darling Basin. So the impacts on burial grounds and the need to actually put people back in country is actually part of what needs to be taken into account when people make decisions about water flows, flooding, floodplains, um, how, um, how to manage the Murray, the, the Murray River, the lakes and the Quorong. So there are all sorts of consequences to what might be seen as an environmental decision um, to, the, uh, to the indigenous people of, of the land that are not understood at the moment by the planning system and are starting to be taken into account. Um, I might uh, uh, leave it there if, um, that's where I may finish. And um, as uh, as was said at the beginning, we're part of the Goiter Institute, and that's a partnership between the, U the universities in South Australia, CSIRO and Ice Warm. I've recently moved with my co-presenter, Daryl Rigney, to University of Technology, Sydney. And um, Daryl's leading up a new research hub called the Indigenous Nations and Collaborative Futures Research Hub in Jambana, um, the Education and Research Centre at um, at UTS. And so we're working out how we can collaborate and work in with Goiter into the future from that context. It's fantastic, Steve. Thanks so, so much for that. It, it's been a huge uh, range of uh, issues to address just in the 15 minutes that you've given us, but it's been so rich and uh, uh, so much in that. There's a few questions coming up on the board as we speak, um, but before I do that, just let me uh, say uh, that uh, thank you for those that have just joined us. There was an IT glitch and there was a half an hour uh, problem in the in the um, email that went out somewhere a week or so ago. So thank you for joining us all the same. There will be a recording. There is a recording being made and that link will come to everybody, um, uh, both attendees and everybody that registered, who even those who couldn't make it. Uh, so definitely get that uh, recording out to everybody in the next few days. Um, all right, let's take some questions. Matt, are you uh, there? You can come on screen if you like. Um, first one up is Christine, is a senior policy officer in Orange in New South Wales, uh, Department of Planning. Christine says, are you able to tell us some lessons learnt from creating the KNYA? I don't know what that stands for. Are you able to provide some advice for other state governments that are interested in creating similar agreements 
uh, with their nations. If you turn your Q&A yeah. uh, button on, you've got to read this a bit more carefully. I, yeah, I'm, again, things are not appearing on my screen quite as I would hope, but it's probably my fault. That's so right. I can just address that question if you like. Um, so the KMY stands for Kung and Ngaraduri Yanad Agreement. That just yep. means listen to what Ngaraduri people um, yep. are saying. And um, there is actually a number of uh, annual reports. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, information on, about it online. So you can have a bit of a look yourself as well. But I think the lessons learnt would be that if, um, if a government is undertaking a, a large complex program on an Indigenous nation's country, um, probably what's needed and what Ngarindiri wanted to have to start that process off was some form of contract agreement with the, uh, with the government around how those programs might, might um, roll out with some recognition of, uh, indigenous nation, of, of the Indigenous nations' um, traditional ownership of the lands and waters and some commitments around including that Indigenous nation in all of the processes that might flow out. So the KMI agreement was a, a baseline for working together um, and to try to, you know, obviously being prepared for complex issues down the track. So I guess that the lesson, key lesson there was that um, it was a very effective way of setting up a context that was much clearer and more fair, and it didn't necessarily rely on pieces of legislation like Aboriginal heritage legislation or native title to actually set that up that flowed later. Yep. Uh, we've got uh, Umar with a hand up. Uh, Umar's from, uh, uh, from the Pan-African University in Chad. Uh, but before that, um, just wanted to uh, explore a bit further. Are you able to provide some advice from Christine's question, advice uh, for other state governments interested in creating similar agreements with their nations? Um, I can have a go. <laughs> um, I think Maybe, that... Might have, to keep it, might have to keep it reasonably short. Sorry about the time, but there's a lot more questions coming up behind this one. Yeah. Well, it, if in, your, in the context there, there's a peak body for indigenous... or peak bodies for indigenous people, communities or nations in that context, I guess it's, it's working closely with those peak bodies to come together to some form of agreement that, that provides a, a context for... The programs to then proceed. So that takes some time to work out what are the principles that are being supported, what does each party recognise in each other's um, uh, responsibilities but also capacity and um, I think what we did was make it a contract law agreement not an MOU so it was actually formally binding to some extent and um, because we don't have treaties um, Ngarindiri leaders were keen to have something that had some legal power to it to actually um, gain recognition before um, the project then emerged. And what happened out of it was a, a very, hmm. a very complicated set of challenges, but at the end of the day, a very positive outcome. So I think starting with a, at the beginning with a with a clear agreement, something that's actually got some serious commitment to it. If you don't have other mechanisms like treaties, um, that's a really useful way to go. Yeah, they're great comments. Yeah, that adds a lot of hope to the to the uh, to the situation. Um, Omar, are you there? Maybe you can come on screen now and have a chat with us. There we go. Coming on now. Your microphone's been is currently muted. There we are. That's on now. I'll, okay. I'll over to you. you. We're coming through loud and clear. Hello. Can you hear me? We can. We can hear you well. Okay. Thank you very much. Actually, I am Omar Al Farouk from the Pan African University based in Algeria. It's a program of the African Union. Uh, with a German uh, government cooperation. Yep. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the uh, nice presentation. Uh, actually, my question is uh, just a quick one. I have two. Uh, with the current trend of the climate change uh, in water resources, so how this was taken into consideration uh, in your research and how the indigenous uh, uh, people knowledge was valuable to which extent, yeah? Because uh, in Chad also we have a similar condition at the Lake Chad uh, uh, region where we have indigenous people uh, uh, with uh, different challenges. And so, uh, so my, my second question uh, is quickly to know the major challenges that you, you face during this risk assessment process uh, in translating this scientific knowledge to uh, this indigenous, uh, uh, this indigenous uh, language. Because in Chad we... I, I don't know if they can understand this uh, scientific knowledge because uh, they are coming from a, a different, like, you know, a completely different uh, language area. Yeah. 
you get the gist of that, uh, Steve. The yep. Translation between the indigenous, uh, particularly in Chad, uh, well, uh, probably widespread. Over to you. Um, okay, I'll have a go at answering some of that. Um, I'll talk about the the um, indigenous uh, knowledge in terms of Ngarindiri knowledge of climate change and also the engagement with uh, between the indigenous and the non-indigenous risk assessment process. I guess Ngarindiri people in their sea country plan, which is an online document, have a statement that actually um, supports the Kyoto Protocol and actually recognising that climate change is something that's having a, a significant impact on the lands and waters and people. So Ngarindiri have uh, been publicly um, advocating a need to take climate change seriously for a long time. The, um, the actual uh, risk assessment table that I put up, which talked about various time slices of assessment of the health of the lands and waters, the first column there was actually a column that related to a particular creation time in Ngarindiri history or Ngarindiri um, creation times, which was, um, it, it, it aligns with the last ice age. It actually talks about a time when climate change was, was, was occurring and the, uh, the coastlines were being flooded. Um, there was an island created, Kango Island at that time, and laws were put in place by creation ancestors to, to provide uh, Ngarindiri with ways of living in a new environment. So changes built into Ngarindiri um, law and, um, and, uh, and abilities, of an ability to make decisions about how to look after people, lands and waters in the best way in the face of change is something that Ngarindiri are uh, familiar with doing in the past before white invasion, but it, but particularly since the lands have been occupied by non-indigenous people, um, issues to do with how do you how do you adapt to change and try to maintain your health as a nation front and centre. Um, the language, the Ngarindiri, um, the concepts and the language that Ngarindiri have in relation to those issues are complex, but Ngarindiri leaders have been working on translating them in an indigenous context for a long time. And um, uh, there's, that table provides a context where con complex concepts like um, miwi, which is a concept to do with spiritual connection to country, sit at the heart of an explanation of Ngarindiri responsibility to look after the lands and waters. And Ngarindiri leaders have been working with education department and others to explain those issues for a long time. I think um, it takes time for um, people with coming from a different from a different cultural background to the scientists who are speak perhaps speaking in English and talking in scientific terms. There needs to be a lot of time spent working together, sharing ideas, becoming familiar with with the different decision making systems, different knowledge systems, and that, you know the project we worked on leading up to this one, pretty much a fifteen year project which enabled Ngarindiri young people and leaders to be part of all of the different processes, spend a lot of time with government scientists and start to actually develop a common language. So there's real understanding. Otherwise yep. you don't get a just relationship at all. Yep. Well, I wanted to leave it there. There is, there is a, a, an enormous number of questions coming through now and comments coming through now, and we're already up to the five, 55 minute mark. So uh, uh, look, maybe I'll take this, uh, uh, send this next question across to you then, uh, Matt, uh, from Alan. Uh, what are important indicators uh, to determine that we have ecologically balanced river system? In the case of Murray Darling Basin, what is the most challenging as aspect? Uh, yeah, it's a big question. Um, I guess in developing the plan, there were specific indicators used around uh, frequency of floodplain inundation um, tied to vegetation requirements and things. So there was uh, about uh, 30 or 40 of those across the basin used to assess the water recovery volumes and how it should be used, uh, and some end of system volumes as well. Uh, but I think now we're moving into more of an implementation space. It, it's linking to the, the monitoring and the requirements. So knowing what, what's happening out in the river and what uh, actually is the highest priority at the moment uh, is the sort of how things get rolled out uh, going forward. Uh, in terms of the biggest challenges, uh, we're making a big change to how the river's been operated compared to the last you know, 50, 100 years or so. Um, so that's a challenge for just you know, the capacity of the system, constraint, how things have been operated. Um, so we're starting to push you know, the current systems of how much flow can be passed through different, different anna branches. Uh, so that's you know, just the day-to-day -day challenges is currently you know, a, big, a big problem. A problem, but you know, sure. limiting the water use.
Yep. Um, what to do next? Uh, and thank you, Uma, for your question. We really appreciate it uh, on uh, straight uh, direct uh, through your microphone. That's been fantastic. Um, we are hitting near the end of this uh, right now. Where to, what to address next? Uh, look, thanks, Benjamin Fee, for your great comment about, uh, about Grant, where did it go? Grant Rigney, a proud Naranjiri man, recently travelled, with, with yourself, recently travelled to Arizona for the 2019 Desert Waters International Symposium. US have provided water rights to some of their First Nations, but are yet to formally recognise environmental water rights. So here's the question from Benjamin. How do you see the potential interactions between environment and proposed cultural water rights in the Murray-Darling Basin playing out? It's going to be hard to answer this. Um, in, the, in the space of time we have, it's already nearly 60 minutes. Let's just take a couple of minutes. I think this is really important. Thanks, Ben, for your question. So was that clear for you? Okay, Steve? Yeah, um, that has been a big question. I think, try to answer it, quickly um, if you look at the range of agreements that we I was talking about um, agreements to the Ngurundjeri speakers country the government recognized that um, there's a registered meeting of uh, a body of water in Ngurundjeri country there are native title rights to water in Ngurundjeri country now um, there's a whole of government agreement there's a cultural knowledge agreement and Ngurundjeri have in up until fairly recently been heavily involved in all forms of um, Water, water research, water planning as much as possible. So my, I think the best way for Indigenous people to um, be involved and have water rights in this context is to play a major role in the, in the management of the river, to have negotiated the right to be, be part of the decision-making processes and then to uh, secure water for, for other uses, um, um, maybe the, the uses for um, agriculture and industry as well, which Indigenous people don't have. But um, to, to have the capacity to be part of the management, if not to collaboratively manage country with, with um, government and to play a major role, it's probably the best, best solution to the, to the cultural water issue because um, you can make a case for where water needs to flow, but if an Indigenous nation aren't, don't have the, um, the connection with government or whoever else to be part of the decision-making process, that may not flow into a, a good outcome for people. So it's a complex question, but I think it, it's a lot more than just one answer. It's yeah, that's for sure. Thanks, thanks, Benjamin. And Steve, Matt, would you have any, any comment to make also around that? Uh, no, not much to add. I guess, uh, yeah, it's something I work in directly. I've, I've been you know, understanding the, the cultural water requirements more broadly as well, and it's not just the... You know, the environmental component, it's much bigger than that. So it's a, it's a really interesting space. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's really, really good, Ben, uh, ben Fee. Thank you for that. And uh, must have been an outstanding visit with uh, Grant Rigney uh, to that Arizona Desert Waters International Symposium. Yeah, thanks a lot for your question. I think we're going to have to leave it there, gentlemen, and uh, everyone joining us today. We've just run out of time and there's so many more questions we could address here. We're going to do this again. Um, stand by for another webinar. It'll probably be 2020, the way this uh, calendar is looking for webinars going, going through the rest of this year. But um, it's been a fantastic hour together. Um, you can see my colleague there has put up a, a, a whole lot of uh, references to future um, uh, webinars and to the um, uh, YouTube channel where all these recordings appear. So whatever you might have missed out on today, uh, go by all means, click on those uh, links there and you'll hear the entire uh, recording uh, freely. It's been fantastic. I uh, just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us and uh, finally just to um, uh, let you all know about the upcoming uh, uh, webinars and courses there on the screen now. Uh, don't forget the feedback form will come up on the screen in a moment. That will be really useful to have your uh, comments and uh, mostly tick boxes but quite quick, take about a minute and, and we'll email the link to this recording today. Well, that's been all we can fit in today. Thank you so much for your time and uh, energy and your attention. Thanks mostly to uh, Dr. Matt Gibbs and Dr. Steve Hemming for your um, inputs. They've been fantastic. Any closing words you'd like to say as we leave? Uh, thanks. Thanks for the, the opportunity to talk to so many people about these critical issues and hopefully Indigenous people play much more of a role in looking after the Murray-Darling Basin in the near future. And yeah, no, thanks to everybody. It's been a good, uh, 
just some participants there. Um, good to give a you know, quick snapshot of what's been happening down here. Yep, fantastic. All right, we'll leave it at that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, bye for now. Bye, Steve. Bye, Matt. And uh, we'll do this again. <laughs> bye. Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au.